There you go. So much. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, as he mentioned, my wife and I, we met in Berkeley, and we're both scientists. And one of the kind of occupational hazards of being the child of two scientists like me and my wife is that your parents like to perform little science experiments on you from time to time. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you a couple of those today, uh, if you'll let me. And uh, I'll demonstrate one of them first. This one I did a few days ago with my son. It involved these two okay. cubes, shown here. And you can see that they're similar size, here, similar shape, similar colors to them, right? And I handed the first one to my son, uh, thusly, Fine. into his hand. And he was like, OK, Dad, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I handed the second one to him, thusly. And he went, whoa, geez. <laughs> and to prove it to you, we took a little photo of him like, using a little teeter-totter with him. And what he realized was that the one on the right there, even though identical to the other one, is tremendously more heavy than the first one. It's almost 10 times heavier. If any of you all don't believe me after the show tonight, you're welcome to come up and lift these for yourself. It's not the kind of thing that makes a good visual demo, but trust me. And so he sensed that, and in looking at these cubes, he realized that a whole new window had opened up doing? on the world to him right. in some way, good. that you could have two Hi. objects that look so similar to each other in every describable way, and yet when you feel them, when you pick them up, you can tell something's wrong. Something's very different about this one versus this one. What is that thing? What is this like secret invisible world of objects that we've never really seen before this point? I loved watching him have that kind of little epiphany because it was really a lot like what I had about five or six years earlier. I was a postdoc at MIT at the time, and I was in a lab where we were trying to measure single cells, and in particular trying to see is there any way you could tell the difference between a healthy cell and a sick cell based on these measurements? And you know, just like these cubes, often these cells would look very similar to each other in terms of their size and their shape and their appearance. And we needed to find ways, properties of these cells that you could measure and use to distinguish a healthy cell from a sick cell. What could that be? Well, it turns out, and the story I'm here to tell you tonight, is that the very property of these two cubes that makes one so ridiculously heavy and the other one feels so light, the very property of these cubes is the same property we found of living cells that lets us tell whether a cell is sick or healthy. And that property is density. You remember density, right? If you're like I was five or six years ago, you learned it in high school and hadn't thought much about it since then, right? Well, hopefully by the end of tonight, I can show you why it's the most awesome physical property and you should really appreciate and love density. Uh, so you might remember that density is the function of two other physical properties of an object, namely their mass, how much an object weighs, and its volume, how much space a little object occupies. And you'll agree that both of those measurements, mass and volume, they're just ways of telling you how much of an object you have, how big is it. But when you divide the two by each other, when you take the mass and divide it by the volume, you get the density, and that's a whole other thing. It tells you so much more than either of mass or volume can tell you on their own. I'll try to give you a few examples of that today. So first, if we're gonna talk about density for a few minutes, we might as well acquaint ourselves with the range of densities that we encounter here on Earth. They range from zero grams per milliliter all the way up to about 22 or 23 for the most dense elements, osmium and iridium. And so we can look at a few spots on this little number line and, and see what the densities of a few things are. On the far left-hand side here, we see the density of gases like helium, 0 0.0002 grams per milliliter, and air is 0 0.0013 grams per milliliter. These are all very low densities. But you notice helium is just a little less dense than air, and that is why when we fill a balloon with helium and let go of it, it goes up. So this is sort of the first example of density giving us something meaningful in our interpretation of the world around us. In this example, what determines when I let something go, whether it goes down or up? It's density. If it's more dense than what's around it, it'll go down. If it's less dense than what's around it, like the balloon, it'll go up. So it's a little example of density telling us something about the world around us. Let's go up the scale a little bit further. Around 2.7, we encounter aluminum, nice metal. And then way up at 19.2 on the density scale, we encounter tungsten. And that is what these two blocks are made of. And that difference, the difference in density between 2.7, aluminum, aluminum can, very light, and tungsten, one of the densest elements uh, that's known, uh, is the reason why my son reacted to these and being so different. And so there's another insight that density can give us. I could walk up on, those, on these blocks, and by looking at them, I couldn't tell you which is tungsten and which is aluminum. But if you let me pick them up, and if I know these density numbers, then it's very easy for me to tell that this is tungsten and that's aluminum. So here, density, a physical property, is giving us a way to identify chemically what material an object's made of. Pretty neat. That idea of using density to identify a substance is not, an old, not a new one. In fact, over 2,000 years ago, Archimedes was asked in the story by the king to determine whether one of the king's crowns was made of pure gold or not. 
And so Archimedes was a smart man. He realized if he could measure the density of the crown and compare that to the known density of pure gold, which is 19.3, very dense, if they equaled, then it proved that the crown was made of pure gold. But if they were different, it meant that the king had been swindled by the crown maker, I guess. And so by measuring density, he knew he could easily tell the difference between pure gold at 19.3 and something like iron pyrite fool's gold at 5.0. But Archimedes faced a challenge. How do you measure the density of an object like a crown? Right, I told you density is mass divided by volume. Now getting the mass of the crown is easy enough, you just weigh it. But how do you measure the volume of the crown without destroying it or melting it down in a way? He needed a way to measure the density of the crown without destroying it. What he came up with was really one of the most, I think, brilliant experimental ideas in the history of science. And this is what it is. He realized that he could weigh the crown underwater. If you've ever been in a pool, you know you weigh a little less underwater than you do standing on dry land, right? Well, how much less do you weigh? Well, the way the math works out, the amount that different that you weigh in the water is a function of two things, the density of the water, which is one, we know that, and the density of you, the object that we're weighing, or the crown. So if we weigh an object like a crown in two different fluids, in this example, in water and air, from those two weight measurements, we can calculate the density of the crown. And that's exactly what Archimedes did, and he was able to determine uh, what the crown was made of. So now, amazingly, 2,000 years later, we still do exactly what Archimedes described so long ago. In this example, this uh, athlete here is being weighed underneath the water. And by combining that measurement with the second measurement of her weight on, on dry land, we'd be able to calculate her density. Why do you need to know a person's density? Well, it turns out, along with telling you what a cube is and all these different things, it can tell you if you're fat or thin. Uh, you've heard the expression fat floats, and it does. If you have a lot of fat in your body, that reduces your net density down to about 1.01 or so. If you have a lot less fat, bone and muscle and things are more dense, so that makes your body more dense, and you reach about 1.07 or 1.08. So here's our first example of density. Remember, a physical property telling us something very biological, very health in nature, in this case, how fat or how thin a person could be, all from density. So back five or six years ago, as a postdoc, we looked at this and saw all the things density could tell you, and we had a thought. What if it worked just as well on single cells? What if, just like I could measure the density of a human body and tell things about the health of the body, could I possibly measure single cells and infer things like the difference between a healthy cell and a sick cell or a cancerous cell based on this density measurement? So we set out to try to do that. And the first challenge was, well, we need to measure the density of a cell, which hadn't really been done before. And we realized we could use the method that Archimedes described, the idea of weighing it in two fluids of different density. But how do you weigh a cell? You might first turn to this if it's in your, your, uh, your kitchen. Uh, but I can tell you, cells are a whole lot too small to weigh on this. And, and tiny living cells don't take too kindly to being plunked down onto a little kitchen scale. So we needed a way to measure the extremely tiny mass of cells in order to figure out what their density was. How do we do that? Well, luckily, the lab I joined as a, uh, as a postdoc already had a little mass sensor that they worked on that was perfect for this job. And to explain to you how it works, I'll show you another experiment I performed on one of my children. Uh, this, <laughs> this is Jack. He's uh, a little jerky up there, but he's a lot smoother than that in real life. Jack, is, it, it looks like he's on a baby bouncer. And he is on a baby bouncer, but it's also a sophisticated mass sensor, believe it or not. You see, the frequency at which he's bouncing up and down as he kicks his legs there, he can't just control that frequency at will. That's actually a fixed frequency. It's a function of a few things that determine it, but crucially, it's a function of his mass. So if he were to, say, sit there and eat a hamburger, uh, that frequency would slow down because his mass would have gone up. That's how it works. So, my wife and I, again, in, this, in the spirit of experimenting on our children, realized we had a, an unexpected mass sensor here, and we decided to calibrate it first. So we put some weights of known weights on it uh, from our weight set, <laughs> ranging from, this is perfectly normal, ranging from five pounds, which had the highest frequency of oscillation, 149 beats per minute, all the way to the highest weight, 20 pounds on the bouncer, which had the slowest frequency of oscillation, only 88 beats per minute. Now that we've calibrated it, like a good scientist, if you're, if you're preparing lab notebooks for any of your lab courses, remember, <laughs> got a good calibration curve, show my data, et cetera. You've done, you've calibrated our mass sensor. Now we're able to put Jack back in it and measure his frequency and determine what his weight is, 20 pounds, and then do the same for his identical twin brother, Henry, and see that he has a slightly lower frequency which means he has a slightly higher mass, and indeed that's exactly true. So here you see, uh, this sensor is so fantastic, we have a baby bouncer that's capable of distinguishing two identical twins from each other. Even I can't do that most days, and I'm their father. <laughs> so, 
this measurement principle is really quite good uh, as a way to weigh something, it turns out. You'll never look at a baby bouncer again the same way, I hope. So here's the, here's the point. If you take that baby bouncer and scale it down, I mean way, way down, so that the bouncing part is about the size of a human hair, at that point, you're able to put a cell on it instead of Jack or Henry and do the same measurement and weigh them. And that's what this tool here does. This was developed uh, at MIT in the lab before I joined it. They call it a suspended microchannel resonator. And at the heart of it is a tiny little bouncer, a little diving board shaped thing that you can see here. And it oscillates like that. If we look inside of it, we don't actually put the cells on the outside of it. We slide the cells on the inside and this little blue channel shown there. If you zoom in on it, that's the sensor. It's oscillating. And when we send a cell like this little red blood cell through, we weigh the cell, basically. So by measuring two cell masses and two fluids of different density, we can calculate the density of the cell, long story short. So there, that's how we do it. What is the density of a cell after all that? Is this even interesting? And what we found, we've measured a bunch of cells, and we found that most cells have a density between 1.0 and 1.2 grams per milliliter. And on one hand, that's not too surprising because water has a density of 1.0. And cells are mostly water, so it makes sense that we would see uh, values around that number. But not all cells have the same density. And I'll give you just a few examples tonight of how the density of a cell can be used to determine something very interesting and get some insights about the cell. Here's the first example. This plot here shows each black dot is the measurement of a single red blood cell from someone's blood. On the bottom, you can see what the density of those cells are, ranging around 1.10, 1.12. On the side here, you can see the weight of each of those cells in picograms. If you don't know picograms or wonder how much a cell weighs, a millionth of a millionth of a gram. Very, very small weights. And so in healthy blood cells, we can see all of those measurements kind of pile up into that little oval region, and that's where we expect them to go. But if you do the same measurement, on cells that part that some of them are infected with malaria, a parasite, uh, we see a few cells over there to the left that are a little less dense than the healthy cells. Those are the cells that are infected with malaria. It's been known for a while that the little parasite that is malaria eats up the hemoglobin in your red blood cells, turns it into a form that's less dense. And the result of that is an infected cell becomes less dense. And we can see that. And we can identify the infected cells compared to the healthy cells based on their density. What else? Here's data showing the mass and volume of cancer cells. These are leukemia cells from a mouse. And you're seeing in the black points the measurements before we treat them with a drug, and in the red points, the measurements after we treat them with an anti-cancer drug. And if you look just at the mass and volume of the cells before and after, black and red, you don't see much of a change. And in fact, if this data was all you had to go by, you might not have thought that drug was any good. But like I said, density is mass divided by volume. If you do that math for each one of these points, you get this story over here, a very much clearer picture. We see that after treatment, just minutes after we dose these cells with a drug, we see that uh, a large number of the cells have increased in their density by a large statistically significant amount. What this means is that just minutes after treating these cells with a drug, we can see that, yeah, those cancer cells are reacting to that drug. We hope that eventually this could become a drug screening tool. You might be able to use that density change as a way to find new cancer drugs based on whether or not the cell's density changes when they encounter the drug. And then I can finish with just a little uh, recent data from my lab here at UC Riverside. This is showing the buoyant mass, which is a function of density, of, single zebra, of a single zebrafish embryo. Why we're studying zebrafish? Well, uh, a few reasons. Uh, zebrafish embryos are a, an aquatic organism, and so if something hurts a zebrafish embryo, like a chemical, then there's reason to think that it would hurt a lot of other fish, and it's probably the kind of chemical you'd want to not have in your waterways. And two, a zebrafish embryo looks a lot like a human embryo. So if something hurts a zebrafish embryo, there's a good reason to think that you wouldn't want to have it around any of your embryos either. So this is what the mass, uh, buoyant mass or density of a healthy zebrafish looks like over time. And then if we do the same measurement on a sick zebrafish that we've exposed to some chemical that uh, makes it ill, we see a very different reaction. We see little decreases in its buoyant mass. It means its density is changing. We don't know what's causing this yet, but what we do know is that we've tried this same experiment on a whole bunch of different sorts of sicknesses, different sorts of toxicants for these zebrafish, and we still see this same signature. It's as if this change is somehow indicative of, of, of a sick zebrafish, uh, regardless of exactly what we did to make it ill. And so where we want to see this going in the future is, you're familiar with the idea of a canary in a coal mine, right? Uh, the, the, the bird that the coal miners brought down to see if the air was safe to breathe. We hope that the density measurements that we're making right now will in the future 
they come like a sort of super canary in a coal mine, that by measuring the density of these organisms, of these embryos or, or other microorganisms, we could have an instrument that will live and sample the groundwater and tell you if there's something dangerous entering into it, or an instrument that can live in the air and sample the air around us and tell us if there's something dangerous, all based on how the density of these organisms react to exposure to whatever's in the environment. So that's one direction we're taking it. So, Hopefully today, I showed you and shared with you why I think density is just the most awesome physical property that's out there. It's something that every object around here, from crowns to cells to fish to you and me, we all have a density. We can't see it, but we can feel it and we can measure it. And if you can measure it accurately enough, you can use it to sort of open up whole new views on the world around you. Thank you. <laughs>